Great. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming to this panel. I, I am going to do something a little different from some of the other panels in that I'm going to let the panelists introduce themselves in part, and this is a warning because I'm recovering from a cold, so I'm going to try to speak as little as possible. But also, we want this panel to be uh, more of a discussion among the panelists and the audience. We're in a nice small room here. Uh, so if I'm speaking, it's only going to be because uh, they've stopped being interesting, which I think is <laughs> very unlikely with this group of people. Uh, so I'm going to jump in quickly and embarrass them a bit by putting their pictures up giant on the screens behind you with a little bit of their bio. And since that's unfair to do without putting up a goofy photo of myself, uh, I'll give a, a quick introduction. Uh, my name is Jeff Wishney. I'm from the Digital Impact Alliance, or DIAL. Uh, which is a, a relatively new NGO that was founded by CETA, the Gates Foundation and USAID, uh, with the mission of building a inclusive digital society for all people. And with that, uh, when your face shows up, please introduce yourself. So uh, Barbara, you have Barbara Barungi has the alphabetical order on? preference. She gets to come is first. Yes. Uh, my name is Barbara Birungi. I'm from Uganda. I co-founded Uganda's first um, tech hub, Hive Collab, and also co-founded uh, Women in Technology Uganda, which is encouraging more women to get online and also to get into STEM. Uh, yeah, that's Great. me. Thank you. And then we have Juscelina Girengani. Uh, hi, my name is Juscelina Girengan. I'm from Mozambique. I am an entrepreneur in the business and ICT consultancy and training field, but I'm also the vice president of the National Youth Entrepreneurs Association. All right. Malavika. Hi, I'm Malavika. Um, I run a new organization called the Digital Asia Hub, which is based in Hong Kong. Uh, it was incubated by the Berkman Center for Internet and Society at Harvard, where I used to be, and we have a regional mandate to look at digital rights. Chris? Uh, hi, I'm the founder of Caribbean Digital. We're a research agency that looks at how we build ethical and sustainable digital economies in emerging markets. And Teresa? Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Teresa Mbagaya. I'm the education lead for Microsoft uh, in East and Southern Africa. In this role, I predominantly work with governments and ministries of education in how we look at digital transformation as far as empowering educators, inspiring students, and building more efficient uh, institutions. So these people who you have up here are uh, deep experts in uh, various aspects of technology and entrepreneurship, and I encourage you to pull up the mobile website and read their full bios at some point, because what they haven't done, because they're very modest, is listed out all of their accomplishments and awards, uh, which would have filled way too many of these slides. Uh, so being the least interesting person up here, I'm going to start with two very dry definitions that I want the panel to help me make uh, a little more interesting. And this is, we're here to talk about digital platforms and the digital platform economy. And these are uh, buzzwords that are um, uh, becoming fairly common right now. I think Accenture has released 10 or 20 reports with these on, on the name, so you know they're popular buzzwords. Uh, but what do they really mean? And uh, you know, a digital platform fundamentally is just a hardware and software system that allows people to deliver functionality on top of it. <coughs> and the digital platform economy is the, uh, the economy, the transactions that happen within the platform and the players who are producing content and functionality on top of the platform. Uh, and my first question for the panel uh, really is, what is new about this? Uh, I mean, I'm old enough that I had a, one of the first PCs, and that was a digital platform, and, uh, and there was an economy on it of people writing software that you could buy and install on it. So what is, what is different uh, and uh, more interesting and about these emergent uh, networked platforms that we all use today? And I'm, I'm looking at Chris, who raised his thumb, so. So uh, I think the platforms have always existed since PCs were popular. I think what's different now is how much of the adjacent economy now absolutely requires access to digital platforms to function. So PCs in the 70s and 80s existed, but people didn't read newspapers on them, didn't consume music on them, didn't buy trips on them, didn't find their life partners on them, 
didn't do all of their banking on them, etc. Mm -hmm. And I, and I think what's fascinating and troubling by the modern digital platform economies is quite the level of monopolistic control they have over the discovery of services in almost every adjacent sector that, that makes it an issue. And so to follow up on, on one point there, the platforms seem to be doing more than they used to. So they're yeah. not just the technology, they're also, uh, Chris mentioned discovery, Barbara. Yeah, just to add on to what he said, um, I think Originally, they were more beneficial to the creators, but now we are seeing even the people who are getting online being able to actually make a living off this and also get, uh, for example, in the banking sector, uh, especially in Africa, so many people were unbanked, but now we are finding ways of getting people to uh, get uh, banked without actually using actual physical banks. So. And I think if I, if I can, Jeff, um, combining what Chris has said and what Barbara has said, what is really new about these platform economies or the digital platforms that we're operating in today is that it's a new model for organizing very traditional ways that marketplaces existed. And so if you take for any of us coming from the African continent or emerging regions, if you take any souk or market within your towns, right, mm -hmm. there's an organized chaos in how they operate. But now you have a woman who's selling her wares and staying in one location from 8 o'clock in the morning until 6 p.m. at night, having a platform with which to now engage more, um, more potential buyers, uh, and in doing so, really organizing the decentralized um, chaos of a lot of the markets and a lot of the supply and demand that exist in, in current markets today. I actually want to add that. Uh, the, platform, uh, the platform economy has actually redefined uh, real interconnectivity. Because if before, like having access to the internet just meant that you had access to information, meaning you could go there and read and know what's, what was going on in other parts of the world, but now you can actually share as well. Or you can, not only can you generate revenue, but it has lowered costs, especially if you talk about entrepreneurs, uh, things like uh, recruiting people, uh, before you actually had to use traditional medias like newspapers or have a lot of money yeah. to re uh, use recruitment agencies. And now you can use all of these social media platforms like LinkedIn and Facebook and have access to information on good candidates, have access, sell your products. Uh, you don't really need to travel from any country in Africa to, to America or to Europe to actually connect with people in, in these different countries. So. Obviously, there have been many benefits that were not there before, and users are not just mere uh, receivers now. They are actually receivers and senders of information. You can basically yeah. create a billion dollar company without any assets on the digital platform. <laughs> yeah, I think also like we've always had platforms in the sense of a family is a platform, a village is a platform, and I think that narrative also bleeds into the way we think of digital platforms. When you look at something like, you know, uh, the whole Taobao village phenomenon in China, it still uses the idea of the village as the centralizing function. Um, and I think it takes the idea of the social and adds the economic to it, mm -hmm. sometimes in favor of the user, who is either a producer or a consumer, depending on which hat they're wearing, but sometimes it's extractive where it's the owner of the platform or the intermediary and the gatekeeper mm -hmm. that is extracting value. But there is still an economic element, which I think is the way it's sort of mediated is slightly different from you know just the family or the village. <laughs> and what I, if I can as well, no. if I can combine um, what has been said by the, the last two ladies here, um, is that it's very much about mobilizing the, per uh, the person. It's very people-centric platforms. Right? Um, not simply about um, how we're looking at communities and villages, but rather how are people generating value from these platforms and adding value to it by um, entrusting them, by uh, growing them within their networks. And I think that's what's also been really interesting about um, this trustworthiness of platforms in the African context or in emerging markets is that we don't traditionally have these levers or indicators um, of how trustworthy is a person in a way that's translatable across multiple platforms. But now we're having to develop that, right? Mm -hmm. It's not simply a word of mouth that if you need a fundi or uh, someone to, to mend your clothes uh, in, in a Swahili term, that you can just go to someone I've recommended. Now there's platforms with which can actually recommend and add that level of trustworthiness or credit worthiness to an individual or a business, right? Um, so it's really about people-centered markets and people-centered platforms.
Can I just add one more thing? <laughs> you don't have to be polite and ask. <laughs> just add. <laughs> is that uh, all over the world, the unemployment rate is growing because what we used to see as traditional sorts of, of employment, like the traditional industries, are decaying because other sorts of technologies that are not platform economies are replacing those types of uh, mechanized jobs. And the only way that we can that we can solve this problem is by having more entrepreneurs, but then we are, we are seeing these platforms as the more, the more proactive and easy way for young people to actually, not just young people, but people in general, to start new businesses with less costs and in, in a more effective and faster uh, uh, a platform. Mm -hmm. So half of, uh, sorry, uh, half of the uh, title of this uh, this session is the promise of platforms, and you're starting to talk about that. What the what the potential benefits are, widening the circle of trust, uh, easing the or creating opportunities for entrepreneurs. Uh, I'm interested what what each of you think are uh, the greatest potential benefits or some good potential benefits, and and get a little concrete about how that actually works. Like how does the circle of trust uh, expand. Mm -hmm. How do entrepreneurs get a leg up on platforms? Yeah. So for me, working with young people, originally there were so many barriers as to why you can't start a business. You have to have an office. You have to. There are so many requirements, which the platform economy is kind of reducing. Right now, in your own house, as <coughs> long as you have a computer, you can start a business and have employees who are not even near you. You can basically run a legit business online that is recognized and even be able to get uh, credit from a bank because of this business that you're running, basically because it's making money. So it's kind of reducing the barriers that people had originally, and it's creating those opportunities. Um, in my own country, 80% of young people are, un are unemployed. Uh, I think 70% of our population is below the age of uh, 30, and then I think more than 50 is below 15. So all these people are graduating from universities every other day, and the jobs are like two to a thousand or whatever it is. And we are seeing young people now taking up opportunities. Of course, new platforms are coming up every other day and young people are taking opportunity on this. But also the informal sector is finding a place within this because you don't need to have a degree. You don't need to have all those other requirements to be able to maybe set up your uh, small business, uh, maybe you are a plumber or something, you've gone to an apprentice shop and you've learned something. Right now, the platform economy can connect you to um, 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 customers. You can be banked without actually moving or going to a bank. You can uh, save your money. You can grow your business. You can find advice from other people who are fundies and basically grow yourself and other people and also get jobs for other people using simply the platform economy. So for me, it is growing the, uh, the African economy and uh, supporting young people. And, and how do people do that in Uganda? So if they're, for in particular, you said the, the plumber will actually find a mm -hmm. business. And, and advertise themselves. How do they do that in Uganda? Um, I use uh, my friend's company. It's actually in Kenya, mm -hmm. uh, joakali.co.ke. Uh, mm -hmm. So basically, as a fundi, or let's say you are a plumber and you are in maybe your house in some slum area and you don't know how to find uh, people, you would get onto this platform and list your skills. This is what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Every single day, there are so many people who need a plumber and they don't know where to actually find one. So this platform is connecting these people. All you have to do is find the contacts and you guys are connected. So I'm making money. I'm also solving a challenge that I have as your customer. Great. There's something similar in India, which is called Baba Job, where mm -hmm. you know, you did, in the old days, you didn't have much mobility. People were born in a particular area. They stayed there for the rest of their lives. They never moved anywhere. Now that you move, you need a cook, you need a driver, you need a gardener, all of these things that you know in India you can have because it's cheap. Uh, there's always someone worse off than you who's willing to do that. Um, but it's usually a circle of known people. You're like, do you know a good cook? Do you know a good tailor? Do you know someone who can help? You go to a new city, you don't know anyone. Mm. And so Baba Job tried to fill that mm. gap by saying, you know, you can list your services and see what you're willing to do. But what they did, which was really interesting, was actually saying the kinds of people, blue collar workers that they were targeting, they, they're not digitally literate. They don't use computers. They don't have access to a smartphone. So their sort of aha moment was using a dumb phone with IVR technology where you literally just keyed numbers in. And it took you a few mm -hmm. minutes to set up a profile based on a few templates. Uh, somebody would call and talk you through it. 
um, and sort of helped you find, you know, the sort of demand supply thing was mediated very, very nicely, um, w which was sort of realistic about bandwidth, about the kind of phone you were mm -hmm. using, which is something often the more sophisticated mm -hmm. platforms don't think about. Uh, and they also have content in so many different local languages, which is really the kind of people you're targeting. And again, that's something that more sophisticated platforms often ignore. I yeah. like this element of localization. Yeah. Um, because oftentimes we talk about a cl cloud first or a mobile first strategy. Um, but these are very global technological terms, right? Um, what exactly does it mean to localize it in some of the countries that we're coming from or in the African continent? And I think what's been really interesting to see is how innovators, entrepreneurs are actually utilizing mobile and cloud to develop solutions that address the realities and comp complexities that we see and we face on a day to day. Right? Um, and it could be as simple as ut utilizing a feature phone to enable more people to participate within a platform economy, mm -hmm. as opposed to only allowing access through smartphones. Yeah. Right? This is one element of localization that would not be possible were we simply to look at uh, technologies or platforms that were emanating from the West and coming into some of our regions. Yeah. Now, um, I think one other element around um, platforms that's exciting for me, um, Barbara had spoken a little bit earlier around mobile money. right? looking at how do we now address the unbanked in uh, a lot of the regions that we're coming in, which for the most part, it's around 70%. So when you look at in the context of Kenya, we have only 23% of adults actually have more uh, formal bank accounts, but 76, 78% have mobile banking through um, PESA. And I, we have to look at how we're localizing, how we're utilizing global technologies to localize to the realities that we see on a day to day. I actually want to add on to that and to say that I think it's it's a practice in most African countries, so I don't know about other low and middle income countries, but we have this practice of, when you talk about financial services, it's a rotative uh, savings program that a lot of people in rural communities, but even in town, especially women, uh, they use this sort of services to have access to, to money, so they every month people save and someone receives mm -hmm. the money for a certain period of time. And it, it's interesting to see that now uh, a lot of, p some people are starting to develop uh, actual technologically based mm -hmm. platforms to enable more people to have access to this kind of service and also to allow people who may be in a different area to be able to save with other people not in the same area where they live. Mm -hmm. So it's those are mm -hmm. things that we can see not only as uh, actual benefits now, but the promise of this platform economies on how they can solve pressing local problems. And I actually wanted to tie that in with uh, the conversation that was happening in the morning where everyone was sort of attacking Google to say doing business is just about profit. Whereas I totally agree that business is about profit, otherwise we would all be in social causes. I think that the primary reason why people adore, ad, ad, adhere to the, the, to the service and products of business is because it's solving some kind of problem. Mm -hmm. So you would not ever start a business that is just merely about money and have so many people in it. And I think it's definitely a, a, a promise if we develop more services and more products, we may take some shares away from Google, but let's not just deny the fact that Google and Facebook and other global platforms have brought so many benefits to us. Let me ask a question about that. It, it, among the, the kind of promises that, that you've mentioned are uh, actually helping be more, a more inclusive society in terms of informal work, financial access, uh, reaching across geography, more connectivity, as you're talking about in the um, uh, the savings groups. But as you're, you're bringing in these global platforms, uh, what have they done as far as uh, empowering people to join the global economy as creators on top of those platforms, app creators on the, the, the Google Play Store, or content creators using YouTube to distribute their, their music and their video? Is that part of the promise of these platforms? Definitely. Oh, sorry. No, no, no. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> it definitely is. It's creating um, visibility for African artists, for example, uh, where you find that uh, originally 
apart from your setting where you are, where you'd physically maybe go and do shows, that is all, or those are the only people who would know you. Right now, I know people who are like Ugandan musicians who have actually gone ahead and won uh, BET awards in the US. And he has never gone to perform in the US, but he actually got an award because his music maybe spoke to someone who spoke to a, a particular crowd and community. So voices are moving around. It's creating opportunity for local products even local women who are maybe making crafts in africa right now they're making their way into different uh countries european countries and all and the women have never stepped there don't even know how it works uh of course it has its own challenges but it's actually creating market beyond even where we are or in the african region and creating uh, global markets for people and actually tied into that uh, into that when you talk about this uh crafts market there are good, good platforms like Etsy and, uh, and others mm -hmm. that I think are definitely creating more market. But even if you talk about just basic social media like Facebook, I think it has enabled a lot of uh, uh, low and middle income countries, uh, entrepreneurs to actually be able to advertise mm -hmm. the products on those platforms at a much lower cost than they would have to pay to have a television advertisement, a newspaper advertisement. And a lot of times, uh, selling is not just about uh, having a store, which is costly anyway, but then using those social medias, we can see a lot of people, in the case of Mozambique, for example, a lot of people, even before they register the business, they already put those services on, on the social media. And whether you pay for the sponsored advertisement or it's free, it gives you a more visibility prior to, for, to you incurring the cost of registration, having an office and all of that. So mm -hmm. I think those are... Sorry, just one more point. In terms of uh, the young people that I work with, right now, um, originally our, com our countries used to import. Okay, they still import somehow software and all that. They'll trust maybe uh, Oracle over a Ugandan uh, build software and stuff like that. But because right now young people are beginning to get onto uh, build uh, applications for maybe the Iris or uh, on the Google uh, Store and all that, the government is realizing that if it can actually get onto this platform and be accepted, maybe we should trust what these young people are doing. And also because of that, we are seeing now work coming in from the US into Uganda because they can see that we are actually building. So it's creating credibility for young people's uh, talents. Yeah. And uh, mm -hmm. Teresa and, and Chris, I'm wondering from the perspective of uh, the global technology giants, the people mm -hmm. who are yes. creating these platforms, what are the benefits and promise that they're seeing in the platforms, both globally, but in uh, local markets in places like South Asia and uh, Sub-Saharan Africa? Absolutely. Um, I'll take this one first. So I've had the pleasure of working for um, global organizations who actually do have a mandate in education. Um, this can be either my time with Google or with Econet um, and now with Microsoft. So while I'm personally very passionate about the intersection of technology and education, I'm working with organizations and, and, and um, entities that not only have that same fervor and interest, but also have the resources to support some of the work that's happening in these spaces. So, I mean, one of the first, the first um, you know, elements of opportunities that corporations see in working in these spaces and uh, investing in platforms is, of course, around the altruism, right? The ability for you to reach and create impact and value in a way that otherwise would not be possible. Um, creating a, a digital platform to allow uh, young entrepreneurs or youth to learn, to be trained, to be certified, uh, that can reach a million people over the course of a year, as opposed to simply going and addressing one by one, right? That's an incredible opportunity. Um, in my time with Econet, what I saw was um, the overall vision of the company was not simply around monetary terms. It was how do we now look at the mobile network operator as a foundational element to some of the development changes that we want to see in a country, whether it is around um, agriculture or fintech or education and health. And so in some of those opportunities, I, got, I had the opportunity to see how scale can actually be impacted by creating these platforms. But it's not all about altruism. You mentioned earlier about um, the essence of businesses is to in fact incur a profit, to be able to, to be a viable business. Uh, my, my closest friends will always say, um, she wants to operate in, in an entity that has the heart of an NGO, but the mind of an enterprise or a company. And I think that's what the experience that I had with Econet, right? You had the opportunity to also look at what is the bottom line for you as a company, but how are you also creating value by engaging in elements of education? So when Econet decided to create EcoSchools as a, uh, not just a service, but a platform for content delivery and engaging students, 
why go through the effort of building a platform which is uh, more work than building a basic product? Mm -hmm. What was the benefit to Econet in, in taking a platform approach? Part of it was around localization. So allowing for uh, local educators to also have a say in some of the content that's being hosted. Um, we didn't simply want to export uh, materials from different parts of the world. We wanted there to be a, an element of a ground up approach to the delivery of services uh, in education in Zimbabwe. What I really appreciated though, that it was not a simple, um, let's build a platform and launch it, but it was an incredible journey in um, how do you actually engage with multiple stakeholders to start and create something where none existed. And so essentially EcoSchool uh, developed to be the first uh, mobile and digital education platform in Zimbabwe. And I think a lot of us are consistently thinking about how do we look at the elements of social services, um, health, education, agriculture, et cetera, but how do we utilize a mobile platform to be able to reach as many people as possible? Uh, in the earlier sessions, the commentary was made around the proliferation of mobile internet in Africa reaching around 20% of the population. But we now have a sense of what that actually means. Uh, it's not simply about a number, but it's also about the impact that can be reached. Any thoughts, Chris? I'm kind of keeping my powder dry for when you switch the slider <laughs> <laughs> to the negative of platforms. All right, be before we go into the really fun part, which is the risk <laughs> side, I'm wondering if anybody in the audience has thoughts on uh, the what they hope to see come out of platforms, whether it's things that have been uh, recognized already, value we've seen, or kind of the hopes and dreams that people have uh, for how things like the, the app economy is going to transform uh, developing technology markets. Because I know we're not the only experts here. I think everyone's probably saving their powder for the next slide. <laughs> for the next yes. Yeah. Um, so just because, um, the microphone for the here, here. Yes, uh, quick thoughts on digital colonialism and how do you think uh, uh, not only not having your own African regional platforms will influence of the imposition of a uh, set of ideas, principles and the ideas that are completely, uh, uh, that is just replication of the past painful process of colonialism in the region. Um, let's get to that in a, in a second, but let me ask you, can you get more specific, digital colonialism is a, I actually love it, it's a great term. I don't love colonialism, I love the term. <laughs> but I'm wondering <laughs> what specifically, um, uh, you know, con more concretely your yeah, concern specifically, is. Specifically, uh, for example, if you don't control uh, the payments platform, for instance, mm -hmm. and you want to reject the austerity policies and uh, s a set of different policies uh, promoted by uh, those who control, or the ident even the identi identification data storage policies that the, those who pr promote the, the online payment platform uh, push. And you depend totally on it. Mm -hmm. And you are unable to decide locally your own rules. Uh, or if you want to change the rules of the game, or if you want to do specific things that are done in a way in Europe or in a way in US, but I in Africa is different. Uh, but you are tied to this inability of having your yeah. own infrastructure to to take decisions that are not conforming with the uh, permanent that's a, decisions. That's a great example. I'm looking or forward. education. Education is another one. I mean, if Microsoft provides all their pl platform for uh, online education, and you want to tell different stories, and you want to change narrative on certain issues, uh, well, yeah. Great, and I think there was a question behind you or a comment. Helani Galpaya from Learn Asia. Uh, we work, um, it's a think tank working in South Asia and Southeast Asia. Um, I've been trying to understand sort of, you started with what are platforms and sort of everything could be classified as a platform. <laughs> so if you look at, you know, the classic trade stuff when you had mode one where pure remote consumption took place with the buy and seller never meeting, which tends very well to a lot of the platform work, or the other modes of two where you know the buyer travels to where the seller is, that mm -hmm. I can see even Uber, for example, right? And you were talking about, somebody else said, you know, there's the discovery function, which mm -hmm. the platform has a lot of control, but then there's also the possibility of carrying out the full transaction, not just the search mm -hmm. function, right? 
So if you just dissect this is in multiple other possible ways, and I'm just looking at trade and the different functionality, do you see differentiated benefits accruing depending on the type of platform? I'm really trying to you know, methodologically yeah. categorize this because it's yeah. something we study, like micro work, you know, the Uber, yep. et, cetera, et cetera, and they have slightly different characteristics, I think. Okay. Uh, that's a great question, and, and we can address that in promise before we switch over to the other question, so please. So I think, w w without sounding like a, a Marxist, which I promise you I'm not, um, <coughs> what we fundamentally see is the way the means of production have been phenomenally democratized. And I think this is the, f the amazing promise of platforms. Genuinely, anyone with a smartphone, as has been described, can start a business, can create some music, and reach a global audience in a way that has never been possible before in, in human history. And, and, and that is one of the amazing promises of platforms. However, the means of distribution have been phenomenally concentrated. So whilst you have, whilst everyone in the world has the opportunity to create or produce, the number of global platforms you can use to then find your audience are decreasing. And, and that means that the kind of, the bit in the middle and the slide I kind of haven't finished working into a report yet, talks about how we need to understand what agency is in the middle around the means of discovery, the means of ranking, the means of rating. Mm. Because actually, if you only have a number of limited platforms you can sell your goods on, whether it's Etsy or otherwise, or whether you can find music, whether that's YouTube or Apple, the crux to whether you're able to be successful and productive or not are means of discovery and ranking. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit more when we talk about the risks, because I don't want to put a downer on everything <laughs> straight away. But, mm -hmm. but that, for me, then becomes the really crucial area of investigation of what are the means of discovery, the means of rating, the means of ranking, and finding your audience. Other thoughts on how uh, the trade, specifically these commerce platforms, accrue different benefits in the different kinds of models? Yeah. Great. All right. Uh, I actually wanted to talk about non-economic platforms. Because I think if you're looking at benefits and promise, that's actually where you see a lot of traction. Mm -hmm. I think digital economy is the only lens through which to view, view platforms is very limiting. So I think you know, if you look at how Brazil created a new legislation and got public comments using mm -hmm. the Participa platform to create the Marco Civil. That's a huge example of community engagement around something as you know, technical as lawmaking, but you actually open that up, or how you get the FCC to get, you know, they do public consultation on net neutrality and people sort of flood in their comments. I think that kind of openness to civic engagement and participation is something that platforms allow, or something much more local like the I paid a bribe.com in India, where mm. if you really want to change the culture of corruption, it's not about, it, it recognized that it's not just people accepting the bribe, there's somebody paying the bribe at the other end. And if we all confess, like Alcoholics Anonymous, that, you know, yes, I paid a bribe, mm -hmm. I'm not proud of it, but I will change, and I've been off the wagon for 20 days, <laughs> or, you know, whatever that is, that's super helpful too, right? Like you're taking mm -hmm. public ownership of a problem. So I think the intangible, emotive, Affective considerations are also huge when you think about the benefit of platforms, and some of them have absolutely no economic value in the short term, mm -hmm. but I think in the long term they have huge systemic and structural change that they can actually help trigger and um, expedite. So I, I just wanted to call out some of those things, like you know, finding potholes, having an app that will let mm -hmm. you find them and you know, geolocate them and send them to government. So that idea of public-private partnership around big social problems, mm -hmm. when you feel government has failed you in so many ways and you think, I could wait for you stupid government people to do this or I could just sort of help and you know, own it <laughs> myself. So I think that's somewhere yeah. that platforms really play a very powerful role. Uh, it's a, a very good point, and I actually think we have a bit of a failure in language in that we don't have a great word that encompasses uh, all the societal interactions that go mm -hmm. beyond economic. My yeah. colleague Beth is grinning in the front row because in the early strategy days of Dial, um, we our, our mission said creating an inclusive digital economy, and I was the one slamming my fist saying it's not just about economics and other yeah, people were saying right. no no we mean economy broadly I'm like well then let's yeah. come up with a better word and, and we <laughs> yeah. we don't have a great word life life is good oh it's chris's fault that makes sense 
And sure. I'll add one more comment um, to what was said, which is around even the political efficacy of some of these platforms, right? Yeah. Um, utilizing Facebook or Twitter to have parallel vote counting during elections. That is of immense value. It may not yeah. be an official voting count, um, but it allows citizens to have a part and actually have a say in how they see politics transacting within their governments. Um, another element was just bringing back um, to not necessarily non-economic terms, but also immense value. Um, what does it mean when you're looking at a, a continent where 75% of the population works in informal sectors for them to be organized, right? Um, and particularly because a lot of these people are women and are young people. Um, what does it mean for a young girl to see her mother actually um, you know, creating a livelihood for herself beyond having to go to the market or having to sell water? Um, and I think these are some of the elements with which we, we look at um, the, you know, the benefits and the opportunities within platforms. It's not only the economic uh, opportunities, yeah. creating developers and apps and exporting uh, talent and platforms, but also what it brings in and allowing um, people to connect to one another, um, people to have a sense of dignity as well. So hopefully people are kind of excited about the potential and promise of these new platforms so we can get to know what Chris has been calling for, uh, which is a little bit about the risks. And maybe we can start with the question about uh, this particular kind of digital colonialism of being restricted in your own, uh, local policies and approaches because of what's encoded in these platforms. Go ahead. I'll speak to, to one thing, which is um, it's, not an, it's not an issue that I have uh, fully resolved within myself, and maybe we'll open it up to some of the panelists. But when we were developing um, EcoSchool in, in Zimbabwe, one of the benefits of uh, operating and working within uh, a network operator is that you do actually have a lot more say in the content that's being disseminated into the public realm, right? And so at that point in time, we were thinking, what are some of the barriers to actually accessing information and content and education? And of course, it's around the cost of connectivity. And so because we were a mobile network operator, there was a business case that was presented and approved to essentially allow us to zero rate um, over 50 international websites and education content and around 25 local uh, content and websites, inclusive of uh, a number of the universities, local universities in Zimbabwe. Now, for a lot of us, we were thinking what immense value it is for someone to be able to access code.org code or access Khan Academy um, and be able to utilize this to actually further their own uh, education advancement. However, there was a lot of critique as well from a net neutrality standpoint, which is to say you essentially are the gatekeepers of what is accessible to the public um, at zero cost. And so I haven't resolved that within myself personally because I understand, I understand both the emotional and the logical appeals to, to the debates. But at the end of the day, it was incredible for us to be able to, to see a student on a matatu or a bus going home and actually utilizing their mobile phone to access some of these content to actually learn during a period of time that there would normally be a lull in, in engagement and in education. So that's one of the, the risks that has been posed around um, looking at platforms. Who has access, who can participate, and at what cost to them? On the particular topic of zero rating, I think one of the, the knock-on effects of that is you, you talked about one of the benefits and the promises is uh, being able to localize these, the, these platforms and provide, for example, local content. But I, I'm wondering, Barbara and Juselina, from the perspective of local entrepreneurs, if, say, somebody wanted to create um, localized educational content to the Ugandan and the Mozambican context, but people had to pay to access it where they got Khan Academy zero rated. What is, what is that, where does that leave the local entrepreneurs? Well, uh, both uh, to what you're saying and what you're saying, uh, one of the things that um, you, we have to appreciate, especially for the African context, is that this is just growing. When you look at the Western world or the developed world, this is something, they, you've been there for maybe 20 or so years, while in Africa, in Uganda specifically, it's like the world is just opening up in, on these platforms and all that. So we are still very young in um, being able to determine whether we actually get onto existing platforms or create our own. And also you have to 
put into uh, context also that the access to finance is also an issue. While we do have the skill and ability to build, the access to certain things to allow that to happen is really limiting for young people. Um, you have a lot of support probably from governments and all that, while in Africa it's uh, a totally different story uh, for us. Same thing uh, to young people trying to build and there's all this that's existing. The beauty of what the young people are doing, what the entrepreneurs are doing is that you're building to the local, you understand, you've actually been there. Let's say you're trying to build uh, an education uh, platform or something for young people. You've been in the system, you know how it works, and so you have a local understanding of what you're trying to create. So that's the beauty or the advantage that local entrepreneurs have over all these other uh, platforms that actually exist. And um, also the fact that most of them, apart from zero rating, exist. Uh, where connectivity is still an issue. So our young people are building, putting in mind that who I am building for doesn't necessarily have access to good internet or even the ability to actually stay on. If it's there, it is pretty expensive and no one is providing it for free. So they're trying to find a way um, that they can build something, make it accessible, but also actually make some little money from it. I actually want to take the question, uh, especially on digital colonialism from a slightly different perspective to say, some people say those who control the information are the king, I'll say those who control the money control the information. And obviously, if we are getting, if we're expecting to get all the financing to develop technology in Africa from Western countries, no. like I said, business is about money. And normally, if a very good platform comes up and you expect to get finance from Google, they either want to buy you, or it's, it's probably not so good, at least at their perspective, so they want to support it. So to have this expectation that they'll just throw money at African developers is not very realistic, which means that, at least for now, uh, although we have some examples that we've been talking about of local developers in Africa, the, the capacity to scale or to develop in Africa uh, apps or platforms that become global, or even if we, if we don't talk about the global scale, how many African platforms do we have that are used throughout Africa or throughout the SADC region, like at the regional level? At least that I know, probably none, or maybe one or two because she mentioned at least like sort of operational softwares that are starting to be used at the country level. So I think we, are, we need to shift the paradigm, one, in terms of where we look at in terms of access to money. And we t when we talk about access to the digital economy, to the to internet, we can't just focus on uh, having the infrastructure, having local developers, but actually looking at what other ways uh, do local economies have to generate revenue, to empower entrepreneurs? So we are the ones who pay to have access to those platforms because we cannot demand uh, more control over Google settings. We cannot demand so much when we, when we are requiring free access. We cannot control the information that it's put there if we actually are not building our platforms. And I think if we want to take money away from Google, we need to be able to put products and services, not just digital, in the market that people from Google buy from us. So I, I see a world where we're not just mere consumers, but we are producers and we are selling to the world, and that's the money that we use to pay to, for internet access. Chris, what are your thoughts on the producer side? So I, I want to pick up a bit on, on, on that point in relationship to to digital colonialism. Um, one of the defining aspects of colonialism is the extraction of value from a country um, with, with, without leading a, leaving a huge amount behind. And this is something that concerns me about the way digital platforms operate because they've done this spectacularly in every market they're in. So this is an issue in the UK where a lot of the big platform companies pay next to no tax. I run a small company of about 20 people and in 2015 I paid more corporate tax than Facebook did. Um, we paid 15k, <laughs> they paid five. Um, so You need better lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> you know, see that? That's the Donald Trump answer. That's not a good answer to come I'd up with. I'd be happy to be president of that <laughs> country. Like it would be an improvement. It's not, a good, it's, not a, it's, it's not a solution to the problem, is to get better at avoiding the tax. But, 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 but that, I think, is a key issue of the way that the platforms work, because in most cases, they they don't leave that behind. But I think it, it becomes... Sorry, Chris, could you describe that a little bit? Like how 
how does this digital extraction so, so work? So here's, here's, here's a particular example. So, so if I take Europe as, a, as, as an example, um, having their core companies that, that, that traffic, and I use the word traffic advisedly, their revenues from their operations in very low tax regimes means that they can literally be a billion dollar company in the UK and pay virtually no corporate tax, which puts huge strain on the infrastructure of the country. Um, and that's in a very well-developed Western country. The, the same is true in emerging markets. I, I, I raised the question at the first session this morning around exactly this topic of, of, of how platforms enable people to be economically productive and, and, and pointed out in our research on winners and losers in the app economy we saw that there wasn't a single sub-Saharan African country where the Google Play Store allows you to have a merchant account to get payment for your app. Mm -hmm. um, so, and that's in-app payments and payments. You can be a developer, you can reach a global audience, but you can't receive an income from it unless you have access to a bank account that sits outside of those. And that, this includes South Africa. This is uh, the whole of sub-Saharan Africa. Now, if you go a little bit further along on the, and you can look this up if you Google Google merchants, um, platform by country, you can see Google's page on this and they lay it out in a nice little chart for you. Um, the 60 odd countries where you can have a merchant account all channel their um, revenues into free entities, one in Delaware, one in Luxembourg and one in Singapore. So my hypothesis is at the moment you can't have a merchant account in sub-Saharan Africa because Google doesn't know what a tax efficient architecture for sub-Saharan Africa looks like. Yeah. Someone should introduce them to Mauritius pretty <laughs> quickly. But so, so, so th this is where my concern about the, the, the role that the risks around platforms have. It's undoubtedly a spectacular thing that we can create so simply and we can distribute so easily. But only if there is strong local ability to retain the revenue and the benefit that's gained by that production. And I think this is where it becomes key. We need more localization, not just of platform and discoverability, but of economic productivity and capture. And, and I think the work that EconoNet did is fantastic. MTN had a program where they were zero rating data for local app entrepreneurs to try and find local audiences. And I think we need more of those activities where actually the economic production is, is retainable by those producers in those markets and is not being extracted to wherever the, le the, the nearest low tax country is. And that's as true of Europe as it is as Africa. Um, just to add a little bit on that uh, and also to her point, um, Africa is not investing in Africa, at least for Africa's context, where you see that even when we build good platforms, I'll give an example of Andela, and it is going somewhere, it is not going to scale to where it should be until a Facebook comes up and takes it up and boom. Can you tell people <laughs> what Andela is? And I'll, I'll counter <laughs> that. I'll counter <laughs> that. <laughs> yeah. um, it's, um, and who their main investor is? I beg your pardon? And who their main investor is? <laughs> oh, so Andela is this platform that helps um, young, it basically trains and builds developers on the continent and then uh, helps them find contracts from all over the world. And so they were doing well. It's originally from Nigeria, doing very well, scaling, scaling. And then f Facebook came up, put in um, 20 24. 24 million. The and now Zuckerberg. it is yeah. Andela. Yeah. It, from Andela to Andela. <laughs> I mean, and um, <laughs> of course, this is for benefit for Facebook, yeah? It's not that they just put money in. So where is this money going when, it, when Andela makes money? back to the US. Originally, it was money in Nigeria. So for me, I kind of see until Africa starts investing in Africa, it's anything that's good and coming out is going to be, uh, even when we are looking for investors, I work with young people. Mm -hmm. Most of the investors in Africa are actually not Africans. They are Americans, Europeans, people who have the money, Chinese. and they yeah. are going to control whatever is coming out of Africa. So basically, they will control Africa, or the at least whatever is coming out, the promises that are, are coming out of this economy. I will say this. Um, I'll agree and then I'll disagree. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I'll agree to the point that Africans are not investing in Africans. Um, and this is because we, I mean, I have a number of enter entrepreneur friends. Uh, and when they go to pitch uh, in, in Kenya, in the surrounding regions versus the U.S., they'll be asked for a viable business, right? Versus their, to take the idea and pitch it in the West, in Europe, and in the U.S., 
And there, the excitement is around the idea and the potential. So what is the expect expectation that we have for entrepreneurs in Africa versus those who are residing elsewhere? Um, and that's why we see such a difficulty in getting local funding for ideas which could actually make a difference um, within our countries. That is my agreement. The disagreement is very small in part, which is um, I think a platform like Andela was always going to succeed, particularly because it had strong leadership and it had backing and it didn't need Zuckerberg money. I mean, there is money and then there's Zuckerberg money, but they didn't require it and they're still doing well. And I, the idea of these platforms is we take a lot of, um, a lot of uh, to the term extra extractive. Um, there's a lot of things that are coming, uh, a lot of entities that are coming into the African context um, and taking a lot of value from, from us, right? Um, in the case of Andela, the idea was how do we take mines from, from Nigeria, from the African continent, and provide them um, to the West and allow those funds then to be remitted back into our, into our countries. So that model was shifting a little bit of how we think about uh, value generation um, in, in, in jobs across multiple borders. I think that level of thinking Is was always Is it still going locally to owned? Um, it, it, was, it was never locally fully owned. Locali locally owned. Chris? It had four founders. So, so picking up on this entrepreneurship thing, I think, points to something really important. And we do ourselves no favor by talking about Silicon Savannah or the Silicon Valley of Af Africa or the Zuckerberg of Africa. Because I think that digital economies in most emerging markets outside of the US, Japan, China, and others are just fundamentally different. Silicon Valley and this, as you say, investment in ideas without a sense of where revenue is coming from is primarily driven by the fact that the US is the world's largest advertising economy. And in the US, you can scale a business to 500 million people and earn enough ad revenue off it to work out how you're going to build a business afterwards. It's fundamentally not possible yeah. in most of the markets we work in. And yet, most people assume you will get the revenue and the return on the unicorns of, of the value that people have seen and invested in. If you look at Facebook, and we're about to publish in the next month a report on digital advertising with the Mozilla Foundation, Facebook earns per quarter gross revenue of around $19 to $20 per user in the US. In the rest of world category, which includes most of the markets we're talking about, it's about $1.50 per quarter gross revenue. Actually, we've driven that number down a bit in our analysis, and we reckon it's between 20 to 50 cents. You can't sustain an advertising-funded business on what may be about 4 to $5 revenue per user, even though your costs to serve those users uh, may be very small. And you're certainly never going to see a return on investment. The internet and the internet business models that succeed in emerging markets are transactional. And this is where I think we get excited about the transactional potential of the way that the internet works. Mm -hmm. And the businesses you will see that have been successful are Flipkart in India, are MCOPA in East Africa, and people that are building off transactional revenue. Mm -hmm. But it requires a completely different mindset in investing. Because if you're investing in a company that can add new servers to scale its business and then cash out on advertising revenue, you'll see a phenomenal return. Mm -hmm. If you're investing in a more traditional business that has customer acquisition costs, gets people online, builds off transactions, it's a long slog to profitability. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of the reason why what could be hugely successful businesses in Africa and Southeast Asia and other markets have not seen investments is just they're not perpetuating this slightly mythical belief that they can be the unicorns that have come out of the valley. So I want to... Uh get on to uh, the next topic area, which this actually alludes to, which is uh, what's missing? What do we need to create in order to make these platforms successful for markets like Sub-Saharan Africa? But before we get to that, there's a big area of risk that we haven't brought up that I want to bring up to the panel, which is Chris mentioned or described, and I think this is a, a great way to describe it, that the means of distribution has become incredibly concentrated, monopolized mm -hmm. even. Um, what is the impact of having a few global companies uh, controlling these platforms have on issues of privacy uh, and, and data security for uh, people living in, in these markets? I'm wondering, Malavika, some of your research has been around um, these questions of privacy and security. What does it mean that Facebook is holding so much data of people in, in sub-Saharan Africa? I think one of the questions that came up during the, I think no one will f find fault if I call it a disastrous campaign on free basics in India, um, the whole zero rating net neutrality mm -hmm. drama, 
uh, it was literally like Facebook doing like how not to run a campaign 101. Um, <laughs> you know, let, let's just tell a developing country that this is good enough for them. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be as good as what the West deserves, like because you're poor, <laughs> you have nothing. Something is better than nothing, right? Taking out full page ads saying something is better than nothing, bad move. <laughs> really bad move, uh, really tone deaf. But one of the things that, that came out in that was people saying, you know, again, this sort of very paternalistic idea of like, oh, but then you can edit Wikipedia. And I'm thinking, no, we want porn just like everyone else. We don't want to edit Wikipedia all day long. <laughs> sort of assuming that, you know, if you really want to dangle a carrot for us to get into a walled garden, make it a really good carrot. <laughs> You know, don't tell us that we get to like look at hospital information and get educated against our will. Mm -hmm. Give us stuff we actually want, right? So I think that was sort of a, a problem. Mm. Not, not that I watch porn or anything. <laughs> <laughs> um, With your laptop open on the... Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> VPNs, great things. Um, but I think one of the things that came up then was this idea of like, well, fine. Um, this idea that Facebook and you know, Free Basics is a gateway drug two other good things that, you know, once you've tried it, you'll want more. And there was this piece of data that kept getting bandied about saying, we found from our research that in 30 days, people convert to paid users. Nobody could so, you know, cite the source of that data. Nobody said where it came from, what it was based on, whether it was internal self-serving research that wasn't externally validated by academics. Like, we don't know. That was just something that it, it just became a meme around that time. Mm -hmm. but. Um, one of the things that became really critical then was saying, well, fine, if they're a gateway and if they get people interested in this wonderful thing called the internet, that's wonderful, because otherwise they would have nothing. But the idea that this was linked to this whole Digital India initiative, which basically meant that Facebook was your gateway to the government. So I was thinking, okay, us having access to Wikipedia and other things like Facebook where you have agency around whether or not you use them. You can choose to be on, you can choose to be off. You have autonomy around those decisions. But if you're partnering with the government and saying that your access to government services that you as a citizen are entitled to will also be delivered through a platform that's run by a private entity, that's really problematic. And, not, and that's not just because I'm not on Facebook. Even otherwise, you know, it's problematic that a private company gets to see who is accessing what, what kinds of government services um, they're looking at. So I think, you know, there are issues of gender, of sexuality, people looking up really critical health information that they don't want other people to know about. So I think that was one example of saying, you can have good private-public partnerships, but is this a good example of one? So I think that was one of mm. the risks of it being a gateway to essential services, which I think was a question of, you know, did it overstep that mark? Um, I think another example is where, um, in, in the context of Aadhaar, which you know Chris was talking about in the earlier panel, um, one of my favorite characters in that drama is an old retired you know army colonel, Colonel Matthews, who's decided that if it's the last thing he does, he's going to bring down this project. You know, if he dies trying, that's okay. You know, it's a noble fight. But he produced what can only be called a scurrilous tract, you know, in like large friendly letters. And on the back of it, he said something that sounds incredibly xenophobic, but actually really resonated with a lot of people. It said, you're not an Indian until an American says so, right? Which was his way of getting at the fact that a lot of the actors in building Aadhaar, even though it was very much touted as a local, you know, initiative, you had all of the sort of, you know, the welfare industrial complex all over it. You had Morpho, SACGEM, like all of the usual vendors of biometric systems, mm -hmm. uh, you know, L1 identity systems, like all mm -hmm. the usual suspects. You had all of the consultants. So that it was this idea of saying, I'm not valid, I'm not counted, I'm not legitimate mm -hmm. in the eyes of my government unless a consortium of external international actors makes that call. So I think that was another thing that I think emotionally you sort of feel like, who, who gets to decide on my citizenship and my residence? Uh, it's, it's not a bunch of external actors. So I think that was another problem. And I think the final thing I'll say is, you know, Chris was talking about sort of the Silicon Valley mentality. And I think the weird way that's often translated in Asia is, oh yeah, you need to fail faster. And until Asia understands how to discuss failure, you're not going anywhere. It, to me, that's incredibly tone deaf because the first thing you know about Asia is that saving face is everything. In countries that you know come from like Chinese ideologies, 
face is everything. You lose face, you've lost your existence, you've lost your status, you've lost everything. So this idea of saying, own up to failure, let's talk about failure stories, this is awesome, let's all you know, have an unconference about it. That just doesn't work in Asia, right? Because the last thing, you, you will die before you admit to failure, right? And that, I'm not saying that's a good thing, but I think there are other ways you can do it. So one of the things I've been developing is a lot of Asian economies love gambling. You know, they will gamble mm -hmm. away their life savings over Diwali or over Chinese New Year. And that's fine. Failing at gambling is okay. It's a culturally okay thing. So I'm thinking if you want people to invest, you want people to take risks, using a gambling metaphor is much more interesting and locally, contextually relevant than the Silicon Valley idea of fail faster because there's yeah. something really tech bro, hard, like, you know, we're all like really macho mm. about this. Like, that doesn't work. Especially when a lot of the women are driving economies in a lot of these countries. So, so I just want to ask, as you, as you build on this, mm -hmm. um, to talk a little bit about how we achieve the promise in these other contexts. So some of it is there's some cultural imperialism around this, uh, yeah. oh, you have to fail fast. And there are other perspectives that can, that can work and help people succeed in these environments. People talked about mis uh, lack of investment or the wrong kind of investment or investment that, didn't fit, that doesn't fit the right models. What else do we need to do to achieve the promise we talked about and avoid some of these risks? I, I, I would jump on that, but such a fantastic point about <laughs> failure and tolerance of failure in digital business models. And we've done a huge amount of work on entrepreneurship. And usually at this stage, I ask this question, which I will of the audience. How many people believe that entrepreneurship is key to to driving growth and driving um, the improvement of, of African economies? You can be honest, stick your hand up. I, I believe it myself. There's a fair smattering. Mm -hmm. How many people in the room work for an organization where an exit at some point is fundamentally going to be the way that organization achieves its goals? One. <laughs> <laughs> so. It always frustrates the hell out of me when we talk about digital entrepreneurship that in most of us, and I actually do work for an organization that is a startup, so I, I, I count myself on the other side of this equation, but most of us sit in very nice salaried roles and spend all the time saying that people who often are already in incredibly risky economic situations should take on more risk and become an entrepreneur in an environment that is probably unlikely to support them. Failing fast in the Silicon Valley when you can just walk down the Sand Hill Road and find another job or an investor is really not failing. Failing, as many of the entrepreneurs building apps in, in Kenya that I speak to, means that you go back to your tomato growing business, is properly failing. Uh, th there's a lovely term from a report I think Dahlberg did with um, the Rockefeller Foundation where they talk about micro-entrepreneurs and I often think, no, that's people living at sustenance levels. You know, they're not micro-entrepreneurs. They're barely yeah. scraping a living. And we're raising an unfeasible set of expectations about what's possible to achieve in the digital economy if we tell people that they can work their way out of poverty in this way. And I, I urge everyone also to look at Mark Graham from the Oxford Internet Institute's mm -hmm. research on digital platform economies, because he's done a lot of work on looking at Upwork and other digital work platforms to really investigate where it is possible to earn a living on those. Um, Before failing you move to the next question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> no, failing means something very different yeah. when you're mm -hmm. at a very low income level. Absolutely, and um, I like this commentary because I, I sat on a panel um, a few years back and they asked, what do you think should be the call to action for, um, for businesses and entrepreneurs? And I think for me, it was around uh, job creation, right? Um, we've touted this, this element of, uh, for entrepreneurs in Africa that you can, you can achieve it. You can be the next billion dollar valued <laughs> company. Um, but then the, the values that we're instilling in, in these young people is around creating that one app that will succeed. But we're not teaching them how to create a business, how to actually employ and create job opportunities. And I think that's more of the responsibility for anyone thinking about entrepreneurship is how do you create longevity and sustainability and create businesses that will employ and allow others to also sustain their livelihoods as well. I actually what? wanted to start by talking about this giant uh, digital tech companies controlling 
uh, our data. And I think it, first, we actually need to reflect on the fact that one, they do, and two, we don't really know what they do with the data. Obviously, in conferences like this, uh, they'll always deny that they use the information to feed onto governments or they use it for any illicit purpose. But the fact is, one, most of us don't read terms and conditions. And two, we have no way in individual countries to actually have access to their structure on how, what they do with the information. But the other thing is, even what they actually tell us that they do, uh, just makes us think that most of these companies are not uh, really, for example, social media companies, the advertisement companies, basically. And they do sell our, our information, whether it's being for governments or not. And it's not really used to promote. Uh, I, I, I agree and I understand what Chris said on the fact that they make more money in the United States than in the other countries. But collectively, they do make a profit out of different Africans and other Asian countries. So it wouldn't, if, if there was no profit, they wouldn't be there and they wouldn't be expanding. So the fact that they are making money out of it should make them more entitled to explain to us or to, to listen to us. And the fact that they barely pay taxes in some of our countries, I'm not too sure. My colleague there, she works at the Ministry of, of Communication Technology in, in Mozambique. And I don't think this big companies such as Facebook or Google pay uh, taxes in Mozambique from the money that they generate. Like we put ad paid advertised uh, at these platforms and we don't see any any reinvestment in the country. We also don't see how, how our local entrepreneurs can scale their businesses using these platforms. So what will happen in the future, rather than just what's happening now with all the data that we're feeding in, the, in these platforms, it's totally unknown for us. And, and like I say, the fact that we don't really know and that we, most of us don't even understand the terms and conditions that well, it's, it is a risk and I think there should be more debate around terms and conditions. On the other side, uh, going back to the, the failure or not failure uh, effect, like I said, I don't, I think technology, internet, it should be more about the information that we get from it and the, the connections or the network and then those possibilities that we get. So I don't think the conversation should just be around uh, being a user or being a developer, but what we can do with it. So maybe it would be hard for a lot of uh, uh, entrepreneurs in middle and low income companies to compete at the tech industry. But my question is, we, a lot of our countries have uh, mineral resources and other, uh, a lot of different streams of income generation. And building entrepreneurs is not just about building tech entrepreneurs. And if, if we could generate income from other sources, and give away this, the, the income that we pay to Google and Facebook, but make money. There are so many small things that we could do and scale up and sell in, in other countries that and we're not getting the investment to do. And for me, do, like if we're talking about uh, achieving the promise, uh, I would say we need to invest more in human capital development, not just technical training, but changing the mindset of, of the people in these countries to make us believe that we don't need a Silicon Valley, but yes, we can be entrepreneurs as well. I think the other interesting thing is like, the focus is all on failing faster, but it's not on testing and piloting faster, which I think really would get around a lot of the problems that we see. With something like Aadhaar, there was so much of this sort of fetishism around, let's just roll it out, one billion people, biggest thing, let's scale it. Like it was all like, let's just do it in real time. And when people said, we don't have a privacy law, we don't know if this will work, we don't know if people with you know, poor quality fingerprints and cataracts will be excluded from a system even more than the existing offline version. We need to test these things. But again, it was the Silicon Valley mentality of, oh, we'll, we'll, we'll beta test it, we'll make it up as we go along and we'll sort of hack it as we go. You can't hack people's lives, right? Like the, just this idea that they were objects of a system rather than engage participants to me was like horrible. And like one example of how a, pi a pilot would have really helped was um, they linked it to a rural employment guarantee scheme and in, in Rajasthan. And they found after a while that even the pe people who used to earn a certain amount of income because they were guaranteed it under this scheme, suddenly after they linked it to direct cash payments to bank accounts, 
it suddenly fell. And people thought that's really non-intuitive. It should be better after like, it's you know less friction, low cost. They don't have to walk to a bank in the <laughs> nearest village. It should actually mean people work more because they're not taking half a day off to go deposit last week's salary. And they found like the weirdest sort of externality, which was that when people were paid on payday, in the company of their peers, publicly, openly, on a Friday evening, it was like, you work six hours, you work 12, you work 15, here's your money. Nobody wanted to be the slacker in their community. Nobody wanted to be embarrassed as being, you know, that lazy guy who didn't pull his weight. Everyone wanted to do really well when they were sort of socially shamed as being the slacker. Mm -hmm. The second that sort of, you know, ostracism was taken away and it was all money invisibly going to bank accounts, there was no social censure of this, so people just stopped working as hard. And the other unintended consequence was that the women didn't see the money because the men operated the bank accounts. So the money that was set aside for household finances, for education, the men drank it away. This is a huge exaggeration, but the women didn't get access to the money when they accosted the guy on the way home from the field and said, you know, cough up, I need half of that money. Um, so these are things that if you just tested it, you would have realized way before that maybe linking to a bank account needed other additional safeguards or other mechanisms. But this fetishism to just roll it out and like we'll figure out the tweaks on the way, they're not tweaks. When they're centralized infrastructure, you don't sort of bake on privacy and security and ethics and inclusion as a little bolt on, you know, here's a little Firefox plugin you can use. It doesn't work that way. It has to come up front and it has to be involving top, you know, bottoms up grassroots people who actually understand the field. I, I think you're, um, you're talking in part about one of the, uh, one of the risks that we haven't brought up explicitly, which is an assumption that, that technology, you know, I think this is not an assumption among this group, yeah. but among a lot of technology producers that it automatically leads to good, that it will lead yeah. to more transparency, whereas you're bringing up a case where it led to less. Technology is uh, the solution. What was the question? The, uh, mm. yeah. But uh, um, we're, we're getting a little late on time, so I, I want to um, give the audience a, a, okay. another opportunity to break in. But Barbara, I know you wanted to say something about achieving the promise. So. Yeah, it, so it's totally different from everything we've talked about. It's um, about the, uh, the platform economy and governments and citizens. Mm -hmm. uh, and what I'm noticing uh, happening at least uh, around Africa, where you find that uh, the platform economy is kind of bringing governments and uh, citizens closer, where right now you find that you have a chance to maybe speak to your minister and talk about challenges that you're facing in your community and have them. Basically, they, it's creating dialogue. But it's also one of the risks that it's creating, which is really huge, is um, a risk for actually life, digital safety, where people are just kind of blabbing out, um, especially in Africa where we have issues with our governments, where people are just, because they have now this voice that has been created by these platforms and they can just talk about whatever challenges they have, and somehow the governments are not responding so well. And because um, telcos can just sell your, give your data, not even sell, give your data to the government, and government can basically tap your conversations, your everything. We are now seeing people being picked up and we're like, wait, what has that person done? Yeah. And uh, they're telling you, so on debt X and X, you called so and so and you say this, and that is creating fear among the people, much as it was looked at as, wow, we can now express ourselves, we can um, talk to our governments, we can talk to people and, and issue, uh, issue um, our challenges. Now it's actually drawing back people and like, no, you better not say that on Facebook. You might just get arrested. Or a guy is arrested and you're like, why was this person arrested? Or they wore a t-shirt that offended the government. And you're like, you know, so it's kind of creating fear where people want to really talk about stuff, but they're like, mm, I don't know if the government will like what I'm saying. I might just be picked up, so let me just <coughs> not say a thing. So it's kind of creating negative self censor. Well. Yeah. Yeah. And it does add an incredible surveillance capability. Mm -hmm. um, I saw some hands going up. Uh, you spoke earlier. I'm wondering if maybe somebody, these other folks, who go first. Okay. Thanks, uh, Aki, and Kimberg from the Finnish uh, Ministry for Foreign Affairs. Um, Maybe going back to the risks and hopefully getting a constructive view on, on, on this from the panel as well. Um, when you think about the economics here of, 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 the, of the platform um, economies, one of the questions here that I'm thinking quite, quite a lot is this kind of whole privatization of economic institutions and activity and related norm setting and rule making. So if you're an entrepreneur that wants to do business on top of a global platform, you have to accept the rules and norms that come with it. 
the entry costs are low, but the exit costs might be huge because there are no alternatives. And also, I mean, labor relations, a very good example. I mean, the platforms typically don't employ anyone. You don't work for the platforms. You're kind of an independent contractor and an you know, entrepreneur uh, on your own. Uber is a very good example of this. So unless you accept their way of working, there are no alternatives, unless there's an, you know, another platform like Uber in your town that you can drive for. But what can we do about this phenomenon when it takes the control in a way um, away from democratic institutions and goes around existing laws and, and tries to categorize, for example, employees as, as uh, contractors. something, yeah, yeah. contractors uh, and so yeah. on. Any okay. views on this? So, so I think we have to have very strong regulation around what a job is. Um, that needs to change. I don't think we can go back to some of the definitions of jobs and work that we've had for the last hundred years because um, the way that people work is just different. But I think we have to have, even if we can't agree what a job or work is, we have to have an understanding of what an employer is. And, and I think we have to have a set of responsibilities that tie into what an employer is and what their responsibilities to their staff are. The other thing that interests me, and I'll go back to that kind of pyramid structure I had where I said, you know, we've distributed the means of, pr of production. I mean, we've, you know, de democratized the means of production, concentrate the means of distribution. The bit in the middle is the bit I start to get really fascinated by as to something we can work with, which is this sense of agency and ranking. Why can't you take, if you spend a long time as an Uber driver, if you leave Uber and go somewhere else, why do you need to build up your ratings from scratch? Why can't you have a portable platform that takes your ratings from digital platform to digital platform. Why can't you have, because that is part of your digital identity. It's the same as your CV. It's the same as taking your qualifications from one job to another job. You know, why can't we have portability around those aspects so that at least if you've invested a long time in working within a digital platform that then for whatever reason doesn't work for you anymore, you're not penalized from having to start from scratch. And how can we make sure that discoverability and the algorithms that drive discoverability are equitable so they don't penalize you. A very quick example is the wonderfully named Noir B&B in the US, which is an Airbnb for uh, black users in the US because uh, Airbnb algorithms are increasingly racist just because a lot of the people that use Airbnb are subconsciously or not racist. So you know, how, how are we working on the architectures of discoverability and finding and managing work and rating for work and how are we making those common fair principles that can be moved across platforms and, and work for people rather than the platform owners? I think also something like Creative Commons has done such a good job in demystifying copyright terms. Mm. I think if we had something similar for this space where when you use any platform, you have very easy seals or marks that can tell you what you know how good it is on a privacy scale, how good it is at security, you know how much it's been hacked. I mean, if we just had some indicators that would allow someone to know upfront, like, is this a safe platform for me to engage with? Has there been lots of fake news? Is it full of not, you know fraud? Like, if there were just immediate sort of like some kind of traffic light system that would alert you, I think that would be really useful as well. And I think to the point about shifting away uh, or taking power away from more democratized enterprises or institutions and moving towards more monopolistic um, entities such as, um, and I, I use this term very loosely, I don't want anyone from Uber to be upset uh, or Airbnb, um, but they have created this entire ecosystem of trust and uh, brand recognition that is just pervasive anywhere you go. Um, and so it makes it incredibly difficult to your point about discovery um, and how your credit worthiness or your trustworthiness can actually translate across oh, different right platforms and borders. If that was capable, <laughs> if that was possible, then it would be a lot easier for uh, businesses and young entrepreneurs coming from different parts of the world to be able to also lift up their platforms and their, um, their businesses to the level that can actually compete more equally or um, with, you know, with the Airbnbs and, and the Ubers of, of the world. But right now, those systems are not there. And when we even talk about creating such systems and regulatory um, you know, policies, that in itself has so many inherent risks. So we're addressing one risk by looking at additional risks. Um, and we'll never have, I don't think, a, a fully comprehensive platform that says um, this will be e equitable for us to now decide which platform to use or to now decide how um, you know, financial motivations and terms can now move from one entity to another. But these are some of the elements that we're thinking about. Yeah. 
Hello, uh, my name is uh, Fatima Biaz. I'm from Morocco. I manage one of the largest startup incubator there, and I have a question for you. I relate to everything you were saying about uh, uh, internet and these platforms, economy, wh who are creating a tremendous value for individuals who now can f can find work or make revenue through their uh, through this platform. However, uh, it's easier than ever to start a platform, but it's very hard to grow it, to employ people and have uh, 100, 200 people uh, starting this uh, very large pl platform. My question is, what I see in Morocco is that um, most of the people who would start these companies are people who have studied uh, abroad, uh, generally who have very high level of education. So I see today that um, Internet is also uh, um, is reproducing the social discrepancies between the people who have had the chance to go to, uh, to to go to school and have very high degree of education, because this platform requires very high level of technology, logistics, and uh, marketing, and so on. So it's not everyone who can do that. So I don't know if you have the same case uh, in different countries and how you see uh, how it is it, how is it possible to be more inclusive in that because. More and more uh, technology, I mean, we are going faster. So if you don't understand it today, you would be completely out of the market in the next five or 10 years. Impossible for you to, to enter the market. Uh, uh, yeah. I would just kind of summarize that question as, and I'll ask it back to the panel. Is, uh, where value is accruing in country, is it really accruing with the elites? And how do we make it more uh, equitable and, and more inclusive? Um, I think for me, it's not a question of where you went to school. It's about how much exposure you've had, really. That's the only difference I see between someone who's been educated abroad and someone who's been educated in Africa. It's just that you just haven't had that much exposure to all these existing platforms that are all over in the US and all over. So when you come to Africa, you're like, wow, this is not there. I saw it there, so let me create it here. So we just need to create that exposure among the young people. Otherwise, in terms of talent or ability to actually create, I do feel like the young people that we have, especially in my country, they can definitely create. We just need to build systems around, um, uh, for example, exposure, but also uh, the challenges that you find that those guys have. They have this uh, tendency of um, over-expecting and um, how do I call it? For example, someone's like, I'm going to build this and it's going to take me two weeks. And if it doesn't take two weeks, they're like it's never going to work and they're moving on to the next thing. So getting them to learn, to get basically on the ground and see how things work so that they understand, then they'll stay long enough to actually build those platforms to see them to um, come to uh, life and grow. I think it's also about pride, right? We have the wrong kind of nationalism in so many countries. We don't have the right kind of actually being proud of using our own products. We want something that came to us mediated through Silicon Valley, Harvard, Yale, Oxford, then we take it seriously. It's gone and uh, got done an IPO somewhere else, then we want to invest in it locally. Mm. So I think until we change that mindset that something local and homegrown is good, uh, we're always going to have that problem that it, it is going to be an elite issue. Yeah. And it's not simply about just changing of mindset. We also have to put our money behind some of these exactly. businesses and platforms. Investing right? Um, if Trump's election taught me anything is you have to support the causes that you believe in. Um, so if you believe in, and I don't want to make this a political <laughs> conversation, but depending on what you believe in, right, if we truly believe that we need to have a better sense of nationalism and a better support of our own local entrepreneurs, then back them, right? Yeah. Don't simply talk about it. That does nothing at the end of the day. Um, and just moving, moving to, to another point that was, um, that was made, um, I think one of the, the elements that uh, I've really appreciated from, um, you know, from working in, in the African context is I've gotten a, an opportunity uh, being in, in South Africa, Zimbabwe, and Kenya to really see how corporate worlds view and uh, receive talent. Right? And to your point around are we valuing those who have studied elsewhere and then come back, the question is um, really about subconscious bias. And that will always, always be there. It will always be there. We can't address this in, in this one conversation. We can't address it in a panel purely speaking about internet policies and how we can make this more equitable and inclusive. But it's something that we now need to recognize exists. We hire and we tend to look for people who maybe look like us, sound like us, or educated like us. That doesn't necessarily mean that you'll have the diversity to in, in, in order for your businesses to fully succeed and to fully thrive. So it's yes, it is also about um, what do we value? Um, is it more of us? And also, what are the types of networks and opportunities that young entrepreneurs now have for their businesses and their platforms to thrive? And I think building this entire architecture is a really long game. You yeah. will not get the quick returns that people expect mm -hmm. 
from tech. We, we're asked a lot because we've done a lot of work on uh, digital entrepreneurship in emerging markets. And we're asked a lot, what will it take to build Silicon Valley in country X? And my answer is always, build Stanford University and wait 60 years. Because actually, it's the entire architecture that comes around that. And I mean, luckily, there are people doing this. Uh, uh, Patrick Awua, who runs a Shetty University mm -hmm. in Ghana, is mm -hmm. doing this. Fred Swanaker, who's now building African Leadership University at, on top of the African Leadership Academy, are doing this. But it takes us to invest in those long-term projects that are going to build the level of caliber mm -hmm. and the supporting architecture to support those people mm -hmm. as they come through so they don't have to go to Harvard and MIT to do it. And I I Sorry, <laughs> uh, we're, we're running out of time. I wanted to maybe queue up two more questions and then... Okay, so uh, I am Carolina Botero from Colombia, Fundación Carisma. Uh, my question goes back to the platforms and I would like to talk about interoperability. I am really worried about the way we started uh, or, or whoever starts the internet has this vision of decent decentralization and more and more what we're seeing is centralization and it got worse in the mobile. I just... For me, it's, it talks too much when you think on the difference between uh, the, the email and WhatsApp. So I use Gmail or I use Hotmail or I use my .org, whatever, and I send an email to any of those, and I get them back to me, and it goes, it works perfectly. I don't even need to know anything behind that. If I use WhatsApp, I mean WhatsApp. If I use Signal, Telegram, Facebook, I get into the enclosure, and that's even worse on mobile phone. How do we deconstruct that? How do we, because I think that will give a lot of power again to the people, and it will break a little bit, I don't, I'm not sure a lot, the monopoly, but, but certainly uh, we have, I don't know, at this point I think we came to the point that we think this is the only way to do it, and it was not like that. So how do we deconstruct that? So this, I think, is a fundamental problem, and Sonia from Alliance for Affordable Internet is going to beat me up about this afterwards when we, when we, when we chat later on. <laughs> but um, we, we've, we, we talk about this a lot in our research. We've looked a lot at access technologies and platforms, and I'm increasingly of the belief that people will exist inside four slowly calcifying ecosystems rather than a, a broad web. And it depresses me to say that intensely. Mm. Um, but when we do user research, people don't talk about the internet. As uh, Lion Asia knows only too well from their research, people will tell you they're not on the internet and then describe how they use Facebook or WhatsApp. So <laughs> I, I, I think there's a, there's, a, there's a user belief in those platforms and, and what they gain from those platforms that means that this concept of an open internet or an open web is is a abstract at best and at worst something that people don't really want to pay for people even don't talk about topping up data on their phone they talk about topping up youtube or topping up facebook uh, their relationship between internet access and a service is absolute mm -hmm. but again this is why i want us to and, and i gave a brown bag talk at usa a couple of weeks ago the title was after access agency because actually, my presumption is that most people will come online within one of those ecosystem platforms. The question for me then is, okay, how do we give them power inside that platform? How do we make those uh, ratings and rankings platforms portable? How do we make people collectively powerful within those architectures so that they can have the same kind of opportunity that I had in 1994, which shows my age terribly, when I downloaded Mosaic for the first time and looked at uh, the web, you know, that world is not coming back much as I would dearly love it to. So how can I build services and <coughs> platforms and policies that allow people to have that agency within these ecosystems? So I think we have time for one more question or comment. And if we've got just... four hands up. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you. Uh, my name is Nigel. I'm from Zimbabwe. Um, I'm an accountant. Um, who is now a journalist. Um, <laughs> so I understand the business side of things. And my sister here from, from Mozambique, she sounds just like me, money, money, money. How do we, <laughs> how do we keep this sustainable? Um, you know, so we, I started this thing almost five years ago. It's, it's an online uh, publication. Uh, you know, context is highly polarized, highly politicized environment. I just wanted the truth to come out, I don't know, naive or stupid or both is kind of what I think I am. But the thing is, I've realized that, you know, we've got 180,000 Twitter followers with over 6 million weekly reach, whatever, right? And it's lovely because it's online. The most interesting thing is everything that we're trying to do 
is actually in the reverse. We're trying to go offline. So we produce 30 videos, 30, 40 videos a week. We're now trying to, we're actually now giving them out as DVDs onto the street. So it's lovely to have this YouTube account that has, you know, 5,000 whatever subscribers, but we think the future isn't always going to be online. In, you know, when, I, when we grow up, and when I grow up particularly, I'd actually like to print the paper, right? I'm waiting for the editor. I, I own the business, but the editor is still the boss to approve for, you know, f to approve this decision. So sometimes this idea, and I, look, I love the internet and I use it every day and I'm, I'm, I'm addicted to Twitter and Facebook, whatever. But the reality is we, and the, there's a, the, the Wi-Fi password is leave no one something, something offline. offline. Yeah, yeah, right? 60%, 67% of the population in Zimbabwe live in the rural areas. They're the majority of people. I'm not the majority. I'm middle class. I went overseas for school. I'm here in, Stock at, in Stockholm. You know, I'm not the majority. And Teresa I understand that. I understand that. So sometimes I think we get caught up in the 180,000 Twitter followers and we think that we made it. And then we forget about the real people that we're actually trying to talk to. Yeah. I think that's a fantastic point. We're about to get cut off and I wanted to uh, turn to the panel and very quickly I asked them each, we'll see if they did this, to prepare a one-line call to action for what they could see all of us in industry do to make platforms, to achieve the promise of platforms in these developing technology markets and avoid some of these risks. Who wants to go first? I'll go first. Uh, for me, it is um, increased accessibility by building infrastructure, at least in Africa. Uh, I'll go next. Uh, I think it has to be very people-centered and people-centric. It's not simply about the potential and the opportunity of the internet, but what people can do in very extraordinary, ex in very extraordinary ways by having access to the internet. I want a buddy system where everyone who's online finds one friend who's offline <laughs> and exchanges <laughs> ideas about what <laughs> works and what doesn't. <laughs> I want to make a call on for governments, actually, t uh, especially in African countries or low and middle income countries, to reinvest in its people ability to develop and be competitive in the market in the world. Mm -hmm. I think just support local discoverability, support local production, and leave value back in the countries you're working in. And my very concrete one would be to Chris's comment about no merchant accounts. Uh, let local producers get paid. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you, panel. Okay.